Happy New Year and welcome to Code with Sar. I am Sar. How are you doing today? Today we're going to talk about a data structure, and that is channel. This is a very useful data structure to implement producer consumer pattern or pops up pattern. And just like most of my other videos, I like to focus on techniques that address the specific problem in a real project. And this time it is a syncing experience of Codename K. I'll start with the showing you what's the problem. And then I'm going to walk you through how channel improves the experience. And by the end of the video, I wish you will have one more tool in your bag to deal with similar situations. Let's get started. Here, I have generated 100 new data points. And then I started thinking, trying to upload all those files onto OneDrive because of my famous low network connection. It's going to take a while. Now think with me. What if I close the app in the middle, or my internet got totally dropped, or the application crashed? Our code should be able to handle those cases. Personally, I think the bottom line is when the application restart, it doesn't keep crashing, and there shouldn't be that loss. But I also think a better experience is to resuming what is left there. To provide that, we will need something to hold the data that hadn't been uploaded, and that's where channel becomes useful. So what is a channel? In a nutshell, a channel is a queue. When we put data into the queue, we call those data messages. So it's queue of messages. Now a channel has two ends. On one, we have writer writing the messages. And on the other, we have reader to read the messages. Here, the reader and the writer work separately and they don't know each other. As a matter of fact, a channel supports multiple readers as well as multiple writers. We don't need to worry about the concurrency in between writers or in between the readers because channel will be handling it. In other words, it's thread safe. Now, because the reader and the writer doesn't talk with each other, it is the channel's responsibility to handle the speed mismatch in between those two. For example, when the reader is faster, channel provides method for the readers to wait. But when the writer is faster, it sets up the boundaries to preventing writers from writing more data to avoid blowing up the memory. So put them together, a channel is a thread safe queue of messages that separates readers and writers and handles boundaries. Well, that is a long sentence. What does that exactly mean? Let's take a look at the code example. First, let's create a channel of string. There are several details. The namespace of channel T is system.threading.channels. A channel, just like a queue, holds payloads. The type of the payloads is string. There's no public constructors for channel T. Instead, the channel class does provide factory methods for creating instances. There are two primary methods, create bounded or create unbounded. A bounded channel will limit the messages in it. It is used to avoid out of memory exception. The unpounded channel then allows the writers to put in as many messages as it can hold, that is until the application runs out of memory. I use the unbounded channel here for simplicity. Next, let's try to put some new messages into the channel. To do that, we call the writer. And since we created a channel of the string, we could put any string onto the channel. Hello channel, for example. And now let's write the code to read it. And of course, by calling the reader. At the end, I'm going to output the message to the console. Let's run it and see. And that's our first channel code. And if I were you, I actually wouldn't feel excited because, uh, hey, Sar, this is a pretty long, complex, unnecessary code to say hello world. Uh, well, it is. But next, I'm going to show you something fancy. Remember, the reader and writer on the channel work separately. So what happens if I do the reader in front of the writer? I'll do it by pushing the fourth line down to the end of the code. So it becomes creating the channel first and then it's waiting on the channel for reading. And then at the end, we start putting stuff in. And when we run the code, it hunts. Guess why? It stops on line five here. When the reader tries to get something, the task of read async on the reader won't move forward until it gets something. So guys, this is probably the first caveat that you're going to encounter when you use a channel by yourself. 
the channels always empty into the code hell. In order to make it work, we're going to put the reading code to its own thread. Let's run the code again. It doesn't hang anymore. It doesn't output the message either. And this is your second caveat. The process ends and the channel got disposed before all the message on it get dealt with. And to verify that, let's uh, add some hacky code. Here yeah, I'm going to print a text, uh, press any key to continue and wait for the input before the process get closed. And let's try that again. Now, if you pay attention to the output, it will uh, press any key to continue being output first. That's from the main thread. And if it wasn't the line 13 to waiting for you the input, the process would be closed there. And right after that, that is the other thread, the one the reader is on, starts the output. Okay, but this is a hack. There's actually a better way to handle this scenario. I'll explain on the way. The first thing that I'm going to do is to call complete on the writer. And then I'm going to put a wait on the completion of the reader. And let me comment out the hacky code. Don't worry if you do not follow what I'm doing at this moment. This is not intuitive. I'll explain more. But let's run the code to see the result first. Okay, this is what we want. No hacky code. The reader reads the data, outputs the message before the whole process got terminated. But why did it work? We touched the two pieces. One, complete the writer. That's easy to understand. That tells the channel, the writer's done. There's no more message going in. The counterintuitive part is why then we wait on the reader's completion. And that's a feature of a channel that the task of reading will never be complete until there's nothing and there will be nothing in the channel. In other words, the main thread will be blocked on line 13 until the reader finishes reading everything in the channel and uh, let me repeat myself, since we complete the writer on line 12, the reader also knows there's going to be no more message at all. When these two criteria are satisfied at the same time, reader will be treated as the complete code on line 13 got unblocked and finished the whole process. Okay, at this moment, I think we see a queue which has a separate reader and the writer. What about thread safe? Let's keep building the example. This time, two threads for writing and one for reading. I'm firstly going to put the current write async into its own thread. And then I'm going to write another task to do another writing. Actually, I think I'm going to do two writes and having one second in between. Feel free to extend the example Things like add loop into the code, spin up more threads. I'm going to keep it simple, but it's multi threads. Now we need to be careful not to finish the writer too early. So I'm going to await until both writing one and writing two tasks finished. And the reader needs to be updated to handle more than one messages. And I do it by leveraging the wait to read async method within a while loop. That is a task of boolean, and it returns true only when there's something on the channel for reading. Let's run and see how it looks like. Wait, uh, this doesn't seem right. Prompt thread to again didn't show up. Something is off. Let's examine the code. Again, two criteria: the writer's down and then the reader's down. Aha, I see the error. I am sorry, it's my mistake. I wait the writing one twice. Now let's correct it and run it again. And ta-da! Well, we got distracted a little bit, but the point is, channel handles multi-threads and it's thread safe. Now that we have the basic understanding of the channel, let's take a look at how is it used in CodeMK. I'll demo some visual first, and then we dive into the code. What you are seeing here is still the CodeMK application. I've updated the code to use channel for upsyncing data points. I will add a new point, and I need you to pay attention to the number in the status bar following the character U, where U stands for upload, and the number will show how many messages is there in the channel. Now let's do it. 
Did you see it? The number jumped to 1, then quickly turned back to 0. If you missed it, you can rewind the video or pay attention to the logs at the bottom of the screen. A new data point has been uploaded. Let's take a look at the code. That's where we're going to see the power of a channel, the decouple of the reader and writer, the thread safe, and more. Let's start with the VO module for adding the data point. Its add point command will be triggered when I add a data point. It calls add point async. Add point async, in turn, did some UI check, and it calls add async on the data point business logic. Go to the implementation of add async. It does business logic check. And on line 64, it will save the data point locally. Once that succeeded, it enqueues the data point for upsyncing. This is where the new data point is used as a payload, and we'll see in a bit it will be sent into a channel. Let's follow the lead. As you can see in the sync service, it checks whether the channel is available for writing, and then it writes the payload of type upsync request. So what is the upsync channel? It is a channel of upsync request, and this is pretty much the end of the story for the writer side. All we did was to put the payload onto the channel. And I'm going to show you the code on the reader side as well, but I do want to point out that it's totally decoupled with the writer side. And again, it is thread safe. That means payload could be put onto the channel at any thread by any event. Once the payloads are on the channel, the reader decides what to do. For example, normally it will start the upload immediately, but if the internet is not there, it could choose to hold the read, which will keep the payloads on the channel for a little bit longer. It could also read those payloads and persistent them into a local file system. Let's take a look at the code. The reader for upsyncing is wrapped up in this upsyncing background service. Background service is out of the scope of this topic. I'll ignore the details about that. All we need to know at this moment is this execute async method. It will be called by the host at the beginning of the application. It's supposed to be a long running task that stops when either the process is done or the process is shutting down gracefully, in which case a cancellation will be requested through the stopping token. Now once the background service is started, we'll do a sanity check for internet access. And on line 59, we wait for anything to show up on the channel. Once the user signed in into their OneDrive, we read a piece of message and then invokes upload. And then it goes back to waiting for another payload showing up on the channel. And then iterate through the same process again and again. And guess what I'm going to say next? All that the reader cares is about the message on the channel. It doesn't matter when is the message there, what put the message onto there, or anything else. So the reader and the writer are decoupled. So far, so good. This is just one issue. When the application quits, and when there's a message left on the channel, the channel will hold the process, right? Now imagine there's no internet access, uploading any data won't success, and the possible outcome would be the application is hung, and that's not what we want. Coming next, I'll show you a technique to persistent whatever is there in the channel, so that the application could exit, and when the app starts again, those messages would be put back into the channel, and the reader will resume the work. The first thing that is needed is a cancellation token for the reader to know stop processing any messages. Then I'll add a delay inside of the reader. This is used to simulate a slower reader so that the messages on the channel will be stacked up. Let's say 5 seconds processing time. And since it will take about 2 seconds for the writer to finish writing, there's probably going to be 2 messages left on the channel. I'll request the cancellation once the writer finishes. Then I will read the channel here and the persistent everything by serialization. And I'm going to output whatever is left on the channel to jobs.json, for example. Let's run it. Now, as we expected, the first message has been handled while the other two left in the channel is persistent into this jobs.json file. 
And now I'm going to add code to deserialize these objects from job.json at the beginning of the application. And since the right async method is thread safe, I could almost do it anywhere. And by the way, this is a demo code. It's not production level code. It's not bug free, but I hope it makes a point. Now let's run the code. This time, two jobs from the last session will be restored. Three new jobs will be added. The first one job will be read and processed, although I don't know which one exactly. By the end of the running, there should be four tasks left. And that's one, two, three, four. Great. Do you want to see how it works in codename K? I have blocked the uploading for now. At the same time, I'm adding the data points. And you can see the number increasing for the uploading channel. Now I'm going to shut down the application and restart it and see the resuming happen. Well, it could also be there's a bug and the resuming didn't work. But you know, I could totally edit it out. So no, you will never see that. Anyway, let's pretend. Alright everyone, again, happy 2022! Keep coping, keep improving, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care!